is this for one hour? Okay, thank you. That's good. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of uh, PathCast. Um, today, uh, I am uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm joined by Dr. Elizabeth Montgomery and Rafat Manan, who are both in uh, Johns Hopkins. So now I'm just going to turn it over to Rafat Manan. Hi, everyone. So we are lucky to have Dr. Montgomery today with us. So thank you so much, Dr. Montgomery, to join us. So she is going to discuss about gastric polyps, and it's all yours, Dr. Montgomery. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you, Dr. Manan. So this will be a session in three parts. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is look at uh, the two common types of gastritis that we see uh, here in our population in the east coast of the United States. And then we're going to look at the kinds of polyps that are associated with them. The stomach is different from the uh, colon, for example, because most polyps in the stomach um, can be accounted for by uh, many cycles of damage and repair, and then finally, uh, either a, a hyperplastic or neoplastic lesion, whereas if you think about it in the colon, almost everything is just sporadic adenomas. The only time we see things that are analogous to stomach tumors is in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease. So let's just start by looking at the most common type of gastritis that we all know and love, just to point out a couple of important things. These are just antrobiopsies from a patient with Helicobacter pylori gastritis. I'm not going to waste your time hunting for organisms, but what I am going to point out is you'll notice that the inflammation tends to be in the top half and not so much in the bottom half. Uh, in fact, this used to be called superficial gastritis until people got smart enough to realize that it was an infectious lesion. So here's another piece of antrum. But what I want you to notice, again, going back to basics, is that basically the pits are all lined up or in an orderly fashion the way they should be with a few cute little antral glands at the bottom and the inflammation up at the top. Let's look at another case, again of Helicobacter pylori gastritis. So here it is, low-hanging fruit. It's more obvious in the antrum. These are antral samples that have a lot of chronic inflammation in the lamina propria right there, easy to see at low magnification. Whereas in the body, which we can he see here, remember the body is the part that has the oxyntic glands. We're going back to basics to remember. Uh, here we have beautiful parietal cells. Uh, let's see, the grayer ones down towards the bottom, I guess. Many of them are chief cells. And then the band of inflammation is right up under the surface. And this pocket is not as inflamed as what we see in the same patient's antrum. Okay, back to basics. Well, after many cycles of damage and repair, uh, from all this gastritis, sometimes we can see giant polyps like this one. Many cycles of damage and repair, and this big juicy polyp, and let's go to higher magnification. This was an antral polyp, and let's take a peek. So the surface is eroded, and there are very striking reactive epithelial changes. Uh, don't, don't, don't be fooled by these, we'll see plenty of dysplasia later. Uh, so this all looks reactive. It looks reactive because the cytoplasm is pink. It's easy to spot nucleoli. And of course, there's an erosion nearby. Please excuse our paging system. All right, so this is in the antrum. And the endoscopist saw a polyp. So we're very lazy here at Johns Hopkins. If our endoscopy colleague sees a bump and we see massive foveolar hyperplasia, as in this case, like right there, we call it a hyperplastic polyp. Now, there are some colleagues who would argue that, oh, no, 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 this is actually a prolapse polyp. We don't care. It doesn't matter. So let's have a look at the epithelium that comprises the surface of this type of polyp. It's just regular old gastric epithelium. Gastric epithelium at the foveolar surface is composed of cells with nice little fat nuclei, and then each cell has an apical mucin cap that's crisply delineated from the rest of the cytoplasm. Important to keep in mind as we proceed. Now, of course, everyone in this room or all over the world, and hello everyone, knows that people um, who have long-standing helicobacter gastritis eventually uh, will have intestinal metaplasia, and eventually that can turn into neoplasia. So here's kind of the typical polyp you might see as a neoplastic polyp in our population in the east coast of the United States. Here's some dinner. 
Here's some more dinner. And here is the polyp. So you can see it looks just like a colorectal tubular adenoma. And we have a clue. This is an antropolyp, and it arose in a background of gastritis, followed by intestinal metaplasia, followed by dysplasia. So this would be a gastric adenoma of an intestinal type. Now, some colleagues have endorsed uh, staining adenomas like this to see if they have co-differentiation uh, co in a gastric phenotype and believe that those are more, more aggressive. Probably in a U.S. population, it's not so important to do that, but certainly colleagues in Korea have found that helpful uh, for predicting which ones will be uh, more nasty. So in other words, the ones that have pure intestinal differentiation are likely are, are less likely to be associated with subsequent invasion than those with co-differentiation. Now let's kind of look at the company this gastric adenoma intestinal type keeps. So we've seen some intestinal metaplasia, and this is probably in an antral pocket. And then up here, where we have oxyntic mucosa, there's a lot of superficial gastritis of the type that we see with Helicobacter. Unfortunately, this fragment is tangentially embedded, so we can't really get a good idea of what the base looks like. Now, there's another cute feature here. In this background gastritis, there are a lot of intraepithelial lymphocytes. So you could say this had a little bit of a lymphocytic gastritis pattern, very nicely shown in, whoops, doesn't show on the screen, in this pocket here. Uh, and uh, lymphocytic gastritis pattern, if you will, uh, is often correlated with celiac disease, but it can also be correlated with helicobacter infection. Here's another example of a gastric polyp that arose in the antrum. And Dr. Manan has seen this case before. He enjoyed it thoroughly. And you can see it looks very much like a colorectal adenoma, except for the fact that it is sitting right in, oh, beautiful diathermy, right? Uh, right in gastric type mucosa. And of course, it looks like there's a lot of intestinal metaplasia. So this polyp has nicely entered the intestinal metaplasia dysplasia sequence. The trouble in patients like this is they sometimes often, or they sometimes have also flat dysplasia. So our gastroenterology colleagues uh, re really find themselves not sure of what to do. In the US, it's very controversial how one would follow intestinal metaplasia. Uh, uh, in the stomach. Uh, we'll talk a little more about that as we talk about the other common type of gastritis. Now, in our um, U.S., uh, northern, you know, northern U.S., if you will, uh, or northern North American U.S. East Coast population, we don't have much Helicobacter pylori gastritis. We only have about uh, we only have Helicobacter pylori in six to seven percent of our biopsies. So your population might be very different from ours. Now for fun, let's enjoy a PAS Alshin blue uh, from this lesion that we just saw. And of course, this is so lovely because it very nicely highlights the company the adenoma keeps. And in fact, some of the areas that look like they're adenomatous also have the intestinal differentiation. So a very, very nice example of what we might call in our population gastric adenoma intestinal type. And then of course, we would grade the dysplasia. Uh, I'm not going to go crazy on that because, as you know, it can be a bit subjective, but let's take a peek. So most of this looks sort of like a regular old tubular adenoma with a retained nuclear polarity, i.e., the long axes of the nuclei are perpendicular to the basement membrane, and the nuclei are all more or less in a row, and you can make a line right through them and see them all. So let's take a look. Is there anything worse in this polyp? And then. That, that gets into the slightly subjective thing with these. Uh, I'm, I, I think I recall that this one had some more impressive areas, and now I'm embarrassed to say I'm not spotting them. Well, fear not, that will come up in another case. Alrighty, so now let's look at another lesion. Uh, this is yet another uh, gastric biopsy. And unfortunately, this was uh, sort of a subtle lesion that was really neither flat nor polypoid, and it was difficult for the endoscopist to see. But you can see that this time, we have another gastric adenoma of the intestinal type, just to get a range of them. Let's look at the company it keeps. Aha, there's the intestinal metaplasia. Uh, let's keep going. And at the international sign of the dot, we'll keep going. 
And one could argue as to whether there is some crowding of these glands. And then glands with this sort of complexity uh, would be regarded by many as a pocket of high-grade dysplasia. Now that's a very, very simplified version of, of the consequences or polyps uh, if you will, that you might see in association with Helicobacter pylori gastritis over time. So the main ones you're going to see, of course, are hyperplastic polyps from cycles of damage and repair, and then gastric adenomas with intestinal differentiation from intestinal metaplasia. Now we're going to look at the other type of gastritis that we see in our population. And if you're not recognizing it in your population, it may be that no one showed you how to recognize it. And that's autoimmune gastritis. So this is a gastric biopsy. And let's go through the fragments and enjoy them. Or you don't have to enjoy them, but we'll go through the fragments. I can't even find the tissue. That's how good I am. OK, bachelor number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So right away at low power, to me, this is autoimmune gastritis. Why? Let's go through it. So we have these fragments on the end, and then we have these disorderly fragments in the middle. Let's study the fragments on the end. The fragments on the end look like lovely antral mucosa, and they're orderly. Notice that where it's well embedded, the little glands are all kind of lined up with the foveolar cells. Here are antral glands at the bottom, and then there's the business in the middle. So it's basically lined up the way it should be. Here's our muscularis mucosa. That is good antrum. It has a few lamina propria inflammatory cells, uh, but not, not the number that you would expect if the patient had helicobacter pylori gastritis. Fragment number two, more of the same, or in Spanish, mas de lo mismo. So the next time this will be in my bad Spanish. So then we continue. Hmm, something is wrong here. The order is gone, even though it looks like antrum. This is body that's been ruined. So you know that immediately. Let's compare. Happy antrum, something that looks like antrum, but it's completely disorganized. The glands aren't lined up nicely like they are here. In addition, there are several types of metaplasia. This is uh, pancreatic metaplasia. So it looks like your little cute pancreatic asini. So cute, right? This is intestinal metaplasia. And there are glands that look like antral glands, but they, they're fake. So that's called pseudopyloric or pyloric metaplasia. I'll show you in a moment why it's called pseudopyloric. I'm lazy and I call it pyloric metaplasia. But another cool thing that this biopsy demonstrates nicely are these little pockets of cells with cute little round nuclei. And they sort of look like carcinoid tumor, but they're just little budya budyas. They're just little tiny uh, pockets. And that's enterochromaffin-like or ECL cell hyperplasia. So very nice example. So what happens in these patients, and let's continue on the fragments, autoimmune gastritis, body, autoimmune gastritis, body, autoimmune gastritis, body. This one is probably badly embedded antrum, and this is antrum. Don't worry, there's a way to confirm if you're not yet comfortable. All right, so these patients have autoimmune loss of their parietal cells with autoantibodies, and they're typically female patients. So these, these ladies, if you will, uh, don't have any acid in their stomach. They eat something and their stomach would like to put some acid on it to digest it but there isn't any so the gastrin secreting cells in their antrum secrete gastrin in an attempt to stimulate acid production but there are no uh, uh, there are no parietal cells so the gastrin levels go up and up and up because the poor little G cells in the antrum are trying to stimulate secretion and nothing happens because gastrin works by stimulating ECL cells to produce histamine to stimulate parietal cells to produce acid, after a while, there's hyperplasia of the endocrine cells, and we can see that so beautifully here. Now, let's get some help from immunos from those in the group who aren't used to these cases. So here's a gastrin stain. Let's enjoy it. So the first fragments that we were pretty sure were uh, antrum, sure enough, have beautiful gastrin immulo labeling right in this sort of area, right between the foveolar area and the antral glands. So isn't that gorgeous? You don't have to think it is, but it is. Here's the second piece. That's got to be antrum. Third piece. Maybe there's sort of a sad one, but basically there's no gastrin. There's a little few cells here 
that could be from the um, transition zone, but basically the G cells are gone. That's why some people call this pseudopyloric metaplasia because it's not really antral. So these fragments from the body have either very little or no G cell staining if you're lucky enough to have a gastrin stain available. Once you get the hang of looking at these though, you really can figure it out without it, but it takes a little while. So this would be body with damage, and now we're back in our friend, the antrum, with this nice clean line of G cells. And here's that other fragment of antrum. That really helps. Now let's take a peek at the chromogranin. Chromogranin, of course, stains ECL cells. And so now we'll start at that same area. So we would expect our G cells to stain with chromogranin, and sure enough, they do. Here they are. But then we get into the body. And the little nodules, sure enough, express chromogranin. That would be called nodular ECL or enterochromaffin-like cell hyperplasia. And then when the cells are all in a line, that would be called linear. And that helps you say, yes, there is hypergastrinemia in this patient. Here's that other body fragment, again with that weird pattern. And then let's get back. Finally, we will have an antral fragment. And now the chromogranin is just in the G cell distribution. All right, so these patients, sort of like our H. pylori patients, have many cycles of damage and repair, and that ultimately results in hyperplastic polyps, just like what we see in our friends uh, with H. pylori gastritis. But they tend to be in the body. So this was clinically a polyp, and our gastroenterology colleagues biopsied it, and it's a beautiful specimen. I'm joking, it's a horrible looking specimen. It looks absolutely deranged, but it was from the body, and it has intestinal metaplasia, and it has pseudopyloric or pyloric metaplasia, depending on your mood. And then it has very prominent foveolar hyperplasia here. So in our lazy system, they see a bump. We see foveolar hyperplasia. It's a hyperplastic polyp. Not very scientific, but it's OK. And now in this surrounding flat area, notice that it's all disordered, just like what we saw in the biopsies that showed autoimmune gastritis alone. If I could focus, it would be better. Alrighty, here happens to be a gastrin stain from that case. And this just confirms for us, if we're unsure, that this really did come from the gastric body because there's scarcely any staining. Now, after many years of hypergastrinemia, patients have their ECL cell hyperplasia that goes on and on and on. This is a partial resection from a middle-aged woman uh, who had a uh, autoimmune gastritis for many years, and this polyp that I'm about to show you was resected from her gastric body. Let's go to high magnification. First of all, the poor woman has absolutely no parietal cells. They've all been replaced by pyloric metaplasia, int uh, intestinal metaplasia, and now that you're onto it, look at the ECL cell hyperplasia. Oh boy, yippee, right? All right, let's see what polyp formed. So here's her polyp, and this would be a type 1 carcinoid. And type 1 carcinoids can take on all kinds of weird appearances. So this one makes tubules, so you might think it's an adenocarcinoma, and it has sort of angulated areas, and then it has areas that could make you think of a lobular carcinoma. Yours truly has made that mistake before. Um, and you can see these sort of sclerotic areas, and we might even find some vascular space invasion. If we did a key 67 on this case, we might find that it ticked out like a G2. The trouble is that it doesn't correlate very well in autoimmune gastritis patients. Uh, they tend to have, and I forget the percentage of cases, it's, I think it's like 20 to 30% of them will have a key 67 index akin to that of a grade two well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, but these guys don't die of, of their uh, of their gastrin stimulated ECL cell type, type one carcinoids or well differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Metastases are rare and deaths are truly exceptional. Now this poor woman's tumor actually did metastasize to a regional lymph node and this case is from about 10 years ago. She's still alive and kicking just fine. The tumor didn't get her. So, oh, here's our vascular space invasion. However, the patient is fine many years later. So don't, don't get too um, uh, uh, bullied by your clinical colleagues to make too much of any uh, key 
67 labeling indices in these carcinoids that are associated with autoimmune gastritis. Now, often people say, when does it stop being uh, ECL cell hyperplasia and become neoplasia uh, and become an issue? Um, and there are many, many papers. There's a huge literature on that that you can read. In my opinion, it's utterly useless in day-to-day -day practice because it doesn't matter. These things don't metastasize and kill patients even when they're like this, so it really doesn't matter at what point or what size it becomes a carcinoid versus ECL cell hyperplasia or dysplasia. So we don't even bother to report ECL cell dysplasia. Uh, the way we do it is moronic. Uh, if our clinical colleague sees a lump and we see a proliferation that looks like this, it's a, it's a type 1 well-differentiated neuroendocrine or carcinoid tumor. Here's another one, and I'm just going to uh, flop up a few of them quickly just to give an idea of the range of appearances that they can have. Anytime you get a gastric biopsy with a weird tumor, check the surface, if it's especially from the body, because these things can look so strange. So you can see this is from the body. There's this bizarre surface that's very disorganized with massive ECL cell hyperplasia. And now there's this lesion that you can see is actually very infiltrative appearing, but we would still expect a favorable outcome. And here it is. Look at these weird pseudoglandular spaces. So don't forget to have funny uh, neuroendocrine tumors in your mind uh, when you see a weird uh, epithelium. Of course, when you see things like this, you find yourself thinking about metastatic lobular carcinoma. Uh, obviously, you want to address that if you have any concerns. And just flashing very quickly, I'll pop up a few more of them uh, just to show you some of the range of the morphology. Again, the clue is to look at the surface. The surface is a mess. It's some kind of gastritis. Once you're able to figure out it's autoimmune, then you really uh, know a great deal about this tumor. Look at all the different morphologies just in this one tumor. Here it looks quite alarming, and then at high magnification, far less so. So very nice example. Let me show you another one that, that I thought was tricky. As we progress through some of the lesions that patients with autoimmune gastritis can have. All right, here's another autoimmune gastritis biopsy. Here we go. So gastric body polyp, even if no one told you this was body, there's something amiss about the mucosa. And you have a clue that something is wrong. There's a lot of intestinal metaplasia, which shows very nicely here. The stain is very dark, so the goblet cells look horrendous. So here's all this intestinal metaplasia, but it's very disorganized. So that's our clue to think of autoimmune gastritis. Now here's the little polyp. I found this very difficult. I thought it was a vascular tumor when I first popped up the slide. And often carcinoids really anywhere, and sorry I'm using the old lady word, carcinoid as opposed to well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, but you know, old dogs can't learn new words. So this is, it's funny. So I even wondered about a metastatic renal cell carcinoma in this case because the, the cytoplasm is kind of vacuolated and bubbly. Uh, so uh, we did get some immuno labeling on this case. And here's our friend, the CAM 5.2. By the way, it's very, I prefer to use CAM 5.2 for carcinoids in the stomach because often the AE13 is negative, and that's especially misleading if they're spindled because you'll find yourself thinking about a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. So here's the CAMP 5.2. Often the AE13 will be very, very weak. And of course, here's our friend, the chromogranin, to help us. Where did the tumor? So there it is. Okay, we get some help. But notice all the ECL cell hyperplasia. Whoops, I should focus. Uh, nodular ECL cell hyperplasia here and linear down here. And you can see that all of the pieces have a lot of this ECL cell hyperplasia. So here you can see the ECL cell or enterochromaffin-like cell hyperplasia in a line here in a nodule. Both of those features are helpful. All right, let's continue. Now, patients with autoimmune gastritis don't just get type 1 well-differentiated neuroendocrine or carcinoid tumors. We have a stomach, that we have a stomach lesion 
and I think here's our friend, right? We have our well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, no problem. Autoimmune, autoimmune gastritis, there will be a few parietal cells left. That shouldn't dissuade you from the diagnosis. Actually, I thought these, oh yeah, there are. There are a few left, but the rest are toast, or in other words, are damaged. That's probably ECL cell hyperplasia rather than part of the neoplasm, but I'm not sure. It doesn't really matter, though. Okay, let's cruise along and enjoy this polyp. So this is a, a, a twofer, or is it a threefer? It might be a threefer. You could regard that as a hyperplastic polyp, but I'm very excited about the twofer part. All right, so patients with autoimmune gastritis get a lot of pyloric metaplasia, and that can go bad, and they get something called pyloric gland adenoma. This one is edematous, but we'll be seeing other ones. We can wipe the junk off the slide. Who didn't clean that slide? That would be me. Um, and, and here's this lesion. It's also part of, the, part of the mess. And this is a pyloric gland adenoma. Here's our pyloric metaplasia. And we come up into the lesion. And this one has a lot of edema, so it's not perfect. But I'll show you some perfect ones as we go through. It's composed of these closely packed tubules. And each one has a basal monolayer of nuclei. And the cytoplasm has a ground glass appearance. You don't have the mucin cap of the type that you would see in a foveal or pure differentiation, nor is it intestinalized. So this is my friend, the pyloric gland adenoma. Often they have this sort of bland appearance, but the nuclei are kind of bigger than you'd expect in regular old pyloric metaplasia. Let's do a comparison. Here's some pyloric metaplasia down here with these little neutral mucin producing glands with tiny little nuclei. So now let's go back to our lesion. Here's our carcinoid. And now here's our pyloric gland adenoma. And the nuclei are, be, are, are larger. And we have that ground glass cytoplasm. And in this case, some of the tubules are cystically dilated. But notice the strange ground glass type cytoplasm. So that's my friend, the pyloric gland adenoma. I love these tumors. And they happen to have GNAS mutations which I think is very interesting because they have these same mutations, whether they're in the sporadic setting, i.e. with autoimmune gastritis, or something we'll see in a little while. Now, pyloric gland adenomas are fully capable of progressing. And here's an example of one that seems to have progressed quite nicely. So let's look around a little bit. Here are areas with the sort of regular old pyloric gland adenoma. And the tubules are closely packed. And they're basically in a mono layer. But look here. Whoops. Let me find the area. Notice here the cells have rounded up and lost their polarity. Very different from intestinal type dysplasia or neoplasia with elongated pencilate nuclei like we, what we see in the colon. These are round. And the way you tell that a pyloric gland adenoma has high grade dysplasia is simply that these round nuclei just spring off the basement membrane and round up and lose their polarity. So it's a little bit different from how we think of, we think of, um, of regular old adenomas of the intestinal type. So here's an area where we have this, uh, these rounded up nuclei that have lost their relation to the basement membrane. These guys are in a monolayer. So in the US, we would say this is a uh, higher grade dysplasia, or high grade dysplasia. Many Japanese colleagues use that sort of thing as evidence of early invasion. It doesn't matter, it's just a different way of doing things from in the US, uh, and those colleagues always treat the lesions endoscopically. Here's another area of what we would call in the Western uh, setting high-grade dysplasia. I believe that some Japanese colleagues would regard this as, as carcinoma. Now, we have a Japanese colleague uh, with us uh, who's done work in both Jap Japan and the US. Uh, she's Dr. Kyoko Oshima. She's a fantastic pathologist in GI and liver. Perhaps she might pipe in about whether she thinks this might have been called adenocarcinoma in Japan. She says, absolutely, you silly girl. <laughs> so it's, it, nobody, I don't think anybody's right or wrong. It's just different uh, because we tend to over-treat things that get high grade, called high-grade dysplasia, whereas Japanese colleagues have a rich history of endoscopic treatments, uh, and they're done extremely well. So it's, all, it's, sort of, it's sort of just the philosophy of how the treatment goes. And this is a beautiful low power 
uh, that shows uh, the, the company it keeps, the pyloric metaplasia, and this fairly progressed lesion. Now this, even I, a foolish Western pathologist, would have to uh, concede has got to be uh, adenocarcinoma that's uh, arising in association with the pyloric gland adenoma. So these really can turn into cancer, and here's certainly some evidence that it's done so. Let's continue. Here's just another example of this phenomenon. Uh, another case of autoimmune gastritis. Are you onto it, guys? Parietal cells are gone. It's very disorderly looking. And this one had a polyp. And this, again, looks like it has the so-called pyloric gland differentiation. And in a Western practice, this would be high-grade dysplasia, uh, whereas uh, uh, this area is probably intramucosal carcinoma, even for a Westerner, and I'm quite confident that colleagues in Japan would regard that as intramucosal carcinoma. Now, let's enjoy a PAS on this case. Here it is. And what I think is wonderful is that it sort of shows what the mucins are doing. So let's take a look and enjoy ourselves. So this is an area with the autoimmune gastritis. Our PAS stain shows the apical mucin cap of regular gastric epithelium. It shows the intestinal metaplasia with goblet cells and then cells devoid of mucin, the brush border, if you will. And then let's look at our pyloric gland adenoma area. So what you'll notice is that it really doesn't have much going on on the mucin stain. There might be, I don't even know if that's a goblet cell, but what you'll notice is that these ground glass cells really just don't have any mucus in them to speak of. So that can be a clue, sort of a poor man's stain for these. Uh, some people also enjoy uh, using a MUC6, mucin core protein 6 uh, stain, to confirm an impression of pyloric gland adenoma. You really don't need to do it, but if you enjoy immuno stains, you'll find that regular pyloric gland stain with it and pyloric gland adenomas show variable staining with it. This one doesn't show a lot, but it shows some. All right, and then just very quickly, another one. And this one, of course, has clearly turned into carcinoma. So you do need to take pyloric gland adenomas seriously in the setting of autoimmune gastritis. Now, of course, patients with autoimmune gastritis can also just get carcinoma. If you're an unlucky person and you have autoimmune gastritis, your probability of uh, being diagnosed with gastric carcinoma is on the order of sevenfold uh, higher than that of everyone else, uh, and that's in a Western population. Now, here's a very nice example of a gastric body biopsy. This is probably antrum. That looks like antrum. Note Notice that this fragment here is far more inflamed, so that's the body with the autoimmune gastritis. If you practice a bit, you'll get the hang of picking out the fragments. So this is antral, this is antral, this is fake antral. See the difference? This is, even though this is badly embedded, it's basically well organized, and this one as well. All right, now this poor patient has a sneaky intramucosal signet ring cell carcinoma in association with the autoimmune gastritis. Isn't that horrible? <laughs> so there it is. Fortunately, it doesn't happen too often, uh, but it should be your practice habit to, to study the mucosa carefully in these patients. All right, now we're going to go into a different category. So we've enjoyed some of the polyps that we can see in association with the two common types of gastritis, but then there are the weird things. They're the syndromic polyps. And they can be quite problematic because the gastric polyps that are found in juvenile polyposis and poots jaeger syndrome uh, really look just like hyperplastic polyps. Your best clue is to know the history of whether the patient has one of those syndromes, which is pretty lame. However, in a Western population at least, the background flat mucosa is likely to be undamaged. And we've just seen in the last 40 minutes uh, the situation with the gastritides in which the background mucosa is damaged. So this is an example that we're going to pop up next of a juvenile polyp, a gastric juvenile polyp in a patient known to have juvenile polyposis. So as you can see, this is a hot mess. It was a giant polyp with lots and lots of foveolar hyperplasia and a very complex architecture.
And these can be very difficult to interpret. To me, this looks like it has foveolar type dysplasia, uh, but it can be a bit subjective. The important thing is what you want to do uh, is uh, get your clinician to check the flat mucosa if there's not uh, yet a history of juvenile polyposis of the gastric type uh, to kind of learn the setting in which it arose. In this particular case, we had biopsies of flat mucosa that did the trick of showing uh, very normal flat mucosa. You wouldn't expect a hyperplastic polyp uh, this dramatic uh, in the setting of normal mucosa in a Western population. Juvenile poly gastric juvenile polyps do undergo that uh, dysplasia carcinoma sequence, uh, and they can be difficult to manage. So here's one. Occasionally, patients will require gastrectomy. Here's another one. So if you get a polyp that looks like this, you do want to think about syndromic polyps. And this one, of course, has become very complex and dysplastic, uh, as you can see in this area. The trouble is that often you don't have the history, so all you can do is suggest testing. You'll notice that this one also seems to have foveolar type dysplasia. In other words, elongated nuclei, but each uh, cell has an apical mucin cap. This is not a pyloric gland adenoma because this is regular gastric mucin. So interesting case. Now, suppose you're sitting there doing your cases and your gastroenterologist gives you a dainty pinch like that. You have a 0% chance of differentiating a juvenile polyp from a hyperplastic polyp from another kind of gastric polyp. I'll pop up another one that caused some diagnostic concerns. Here's another juvenile polyp of the stomach in a patient known to have gastric juvenile polyposis, and it had a fuller area. And this is a good opportunity to show you something. So basically, this is a, a nice gastric juvenile polyp. I cannot tell it from a hyperplastic polyp, but the clue that it might be syndromic is the flat surface overall. Often hyperplastic polyps of the sporadic type don't have such a smooth surface. Unfortunately, we don't have a 1x here. I'm sure my colleague, Dr. Voltaggio, is laughing at me as she listens to me say there's no 1x. Now, this particular fragment has a problem. It has these, it's very damaged. It looks like it's been eroded. And look at these glands. So you can see the outlines of glands, I'm doing a bad job focusing, in which there are all these sloughed cells. This is called signet ring cell change. And sometimes when mucosa is damaged, the epithelial cells peel off the basement membrane and round up into the lumen, imparting an appearance very similar to that of signet ring cell carcinoma. The trick is that they're all basically within inside the glands they're supposed to be. Real signet ring cell carcinoma doesn't grow in the lumen of glands, it grows uh, into the lamina propria. So all these evil things are confi confined. Now, of course, this has to occur in an area where the slide is folded and difficult to evaluate, right? So if you get one of these and you're scared, one trick you can do, and I don't, is to do an ecadherin stain and if you will do, if you do that, you will find that all of these cells retain their ecadherin. Now, this is not the world's most beautiful ecadherin, but it does the job. Some people actually use reticulin uh, as a poor man's uh, version of this, and the reticulin will outline each of these glands in which the sort of sloughed, degenerated uh, foveolar cells have piled. Uh, again, this fuller is called signet ring cell change. Let me pop up another uh, gastrectomy. This is a gastrectomy from a patient with juvenile polyposis. And here's this horrible looking giant polyp. This patient uh, had so many polyps, many with dysplasia, that uh, uh, she couldn't be managed endoscopically. But I just want you to see, this was actually uh, just massive foveolar hyperplasia uh, here uh, in this patient with juvenile polyposis. Can I tell in isolation that this is syndromic? No, but there's a clue. Look at the mucosa underneath. This is, this is just a normal antrum mucosa. I may have made a mistake and said this was body, this was antrum, and you can see it basically has what it's supposed to have and is basically orderly and uninflamed. So at least in a western population, in juvenile polyposis or Putz-Jaeger polyposis, your background mucosa will be fine. And with that, let's take a quick peek at some gastric uh, Putz-Jaeger's polyps. We'll start with the low-hanging fruit. This is a Putz-Jaeger's polyp from the small bowel. 
Those are easy peasy to recognize. Here it is. This one has pseudo invasion, but don't pay attention now. Don't look at that. Let's look at the polyp. So it's in normal small bowel mucosa. And then it consists of these big globs of site specific mucosa, i.e., small bowel mucosa, partitioned off by cords of smooth muscle. We can do this. This is very easy. Now let's look at high magnification. And we can see that this is basically the mucosa that's supposed to be there. This is small bowel uh, mucosa. This is not a traditional serrated adenoma. This is just normal small bowel mucosa, complete with lamina propria. Very, very easy in the small bowel. Now pay no attention to the pseudo invasion. It's fairly common. However, if our endoscopy colleague gives us this dainty little kiss of the, of the thing, of course, we don't have a prayer of making a diagnosis. Let's look at some uh, Boots Jaeger's polyps from another patient. This one happens to be perfect. This is the gastric Boots Jaeger's polyp. It has a site specific mucosa partitioned off by cords of smooth muscle. But this one is really annoying because there seems to be a joining gastritis. So in a case like this, you really need to get some help. Now in this particular patient, the help was forthcoming uh, because we had a classic gastric Putz-Jaeger's polyp in the, or I'm sorry, small bowel Putz-Jaeger's polyp. This is a second polyp from the same patient. If I receive this biopsy tomorrow, I would probably misdiagnose it as a hyperplastic polyp, except in this particular patient, I knew the patient had the syndrome, and this particular gastric Putz-Jaeger's polyp uh, has high-grade dysplasia uh, and intramucosal adenocarcinoma. That's very, very rare. Let's go back to normal. Okay, let's try another one. Another patient with Putz-Jaeger's syndrome. This one is really cool. This one follows the rules for a Western population Putz-Jaeger's polyp. Basically, we have pretty unremarkable oxyntic mucosa, this biopsy was from a polyp. We have all the stuff we're supposed to have. We have our parietal cells and our chief cells. So we have our parietal cells here, down in here, our chief cells. And of course, up here, we have a few mucous neck cells and then our foveolar surface. And in this area of polyp, we do have these chunks of smooth muscle partitioning very happy, uninflamed uh, gastric oxyntic mucosa. However, you know, if this was the first diagnosis, it's probably not a good idea to trust it. Luckily, in this patient, here's the small bowel polyp, which is very easy to diagnose. So unfortunately, these syndromic polyps can be a real bear. Let's see, let me pop one more up. This is another gastric Putz-Jaeger's polyp. I don't know that this would be very easy to diagnose prospectively. Here's a sneaky cord of smooth muscle, but it basically looks like a hyperplastic polyp. We would be foolish to try to unequivocally make a diagnosis of putz syndrome based on this polyp in isolation. Now, it's very interesting. Patients with familial adenomatosis, familial adenomatous polyposis also get a lot of interesting gastric polyps. This is a great polyp. This is an antral polyp. And usually when we see antral polyps that look like adenomas with intestinal differentiation, as in this case, they're associated with very damaged antral mucosa. But this is really scarcely damaged at all, and there's no intestinal metaplasia. So a very nice example of a gastric adenoma intestinal type in a patient uh, with familial adenomatous polyposis. This happens to be a PASAB from that case. You'll notice the pristine background antral mucosa. And then here's our little good, 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 good cute adenoma. And it really truly has intestinal differentiation. Yay! The other thing we tend to see in patients with familial adenomatous polyposis is fundic gland polyps. About 100% of them have them by the time they're full-grown adults. And in children, the percentage is much lower, more on the order of a quarter, depending on whose paper you read. But by the time people reach adulthood, if they have FAP, virtually all of them have fundic gland polyps. Now, some of the fundic gland polyps get dysplasia in them. We can quibble over what grade to make this dysplasia. Uh, you could argue for 
for either high or low here. Low to keep the surgeon from doing something stupid, and high based on the on the rounded up nucle nuclei at the surface that have lost their uh, uh, relationship to the basement membrane. I will confess that we tend to downgrade here uh, uh, because we're concerned that someone might overtreat. Uh, whereas it would be perfectly safe to diagnose this focus as high grade dysplasia in this fundic gland polyp. Um, uh, were one in a setting where one was sure that the surgeon wouldn't overtreat. In the sporadic setting, dysplasia in fundic gland polyps has never been reported to progress to a bona fide adenocarcinoma with an uh, invasion or metastasis. In the FAP setting, there are occasional reports of this, but it's even rare then. Some patients even have a carpeting of fundic gland polyps. Uh, generally in association with familial adenomatous polyposis. What's interesting to me is that these, um, this dysplastic stuff uh, shows very much classic foveolar differentiation. This is a PAS Alcian blue, and there's some cells that are sort of round, but basically uh, they all have foveolar type uh, mucin uh, with, a, with a nice magenta to color on the PASAB. I don't know if this shows well. These aren't goblet cells. They're just sort of fake foveolar cells that have a round appearance. Let's look at another familial adenomatous polyposis patient. Uh, this is a patient's colon biopsies. They were fairly young, so they hadn't yet had their colectomy. So you can see there are lots of them. I don't think this is a diagnostic problem. Let's enjoy the same patient's gastric biopsies. Here we are. And I think this is really interesting because obviously there's a lot of foveolar pattern, low-grade dysplasia, and this brings up a point that I can't say I know the answer to. If you just had this thing, you might regard this as a gastric adenoma of the gastric foveolar type. There's this uh, low-grade pattern dysplasia, and then there's an apical mucin cap in each cell. So you could call this a gastric adenoma, gastric foveolar type, arising in unremarkable oxyntic mucosa. Great, but then you come to the next polyp and you see the same sort of stuff, but it's over top of cystically dilated glands. Like there, and I think there's another one like that in this piece, ah, here. So then the question is, is this low-grade dysplasia sitting on top of a fundic gland polyp or is it a gastric foveolar adenoma or gastric adenoma foveolar type? I would like to tell you that I know the answer, but I don't. Fortunately, it doesn't matter, and neither type is likely to progress. Now, we'll close with one more. Uh, oh, and I forgot to tell you that um, I didn't grab a slide with it, but pyloric gland adenomas also are overrepresented in patients with familial adenomatous polyposis. And curiously, those adenomas also still have GNAS mutations, which I think is really interesting. And of course, the patient alone has already uh, mutations in the APC gene. So I'll close by showing you a few cases of something that uh, has been uh, di or known by more than one name. And that is what we have called, um, probably not very well, uh, we've called it the oxyntic gland adenoma. Other people have called it the chief cell adenoma. Uh, and other colleagues regard these as highly differentiated adenoma carcinomas with minimal risk for metastasis. In our population, at least, these always arise in, not surprisingly, oxyntic mucosa because they differentiate that way, sort of like fundic gland polyps always arise in oxyntic mucosa because they're in the fundus. Um, this type of adenoma or carcinoma, depending on your viewpoint, uh, arises just under the surface of oxyntic mucosa and and it's a very curious kind of polyp because it's kind of scary looking. It has these angulated glands, and you can see them nicely here, uh, that tend to have... Um, Dr. Robert Jones, you have a call on one Sorry. They tend to have chief cell differentiation, but you'll notice that there are a lot of interspersed parietal cells. So we call them oxyntic gland adenomas. Uh, and, and they're very curious because they have this horrendous infiltrative pattern of growth, but yet there has yet to be a report of a metastasis with, with these. Now, Japanese colleagues regard these as highly, or as very low-grade adenocarcinomas, and they call them adenocarcinoma with chief cell differentiation. 
Those colleagues like to make sure they're completely endoscopically removed. There's never been a report of a metastasis, but perhaps they're so low grade that you would need hundreds of cases to find one. So for the moment, uh, since we're not 100% sure they're benign, it's, we always recommend that they be completely removed. And you can see that there's diathermy here. Here's more of this polyp. How yeah. do you differentiate this adenoma from a pyloric adenoma? Look at the surface. The pyloric gland adenoma extends to the surface, and it tends to occur in damaged mucosa with autoimmune gastritis. This is, these typically occur in undamaged oxyntic mucosa. And notice that the actual surface has a cap of foveolar cells, whereas the pyloric gland adenoma doesn't. These tubules in the oxyntic gland adenoma are angulated, and they are not in the pyloric gland adenoma. Also, there are interspersed parietal cells in the oxyntic gland adenoma, and they're not present in the pyloric gland adenoma. Thanks for bringing that up. This happens to be a key 67 on this case. And we've carefully um, removed the lesion from the slide. This one has a higher proliferation index than many, and I have quite a few that have actually almost no proliferation index. Uh, I didn't grab them. Here's another one. Oh, one more cutie thing. This is a MUX6. They express MUX6, so that doesn't help you to distinguish them uh, from pyloric gland adenoma, but they don't tend to co-express MUX5AC as much as pyloric gland adenoma, so you can get a little help. Here's another one of these lesions. Remember, we've been calling them oxyntic gland adenomas. Some colleagues have been calling them highly differentiated carcinomas. They have an excellent prognosis uh, following a complete removal. Here's another example with these very angulated glands. You can also, and this one has a mitosis, and you can occasionally see these uh, in patients with familial adenomatous polyposis, I, and they also have GNAS mutations. So they're probably actually in a spectrum with pyloric gland adenoma, uh, just like our, our cool colleague, uh, Dr. Manon, just indicated. So we've come to the end of the hour, and perhaps there are some discussion points. We have a couple of questions uh, from our online viewers. So I would like to share those questions with you. So there is one question being asked. Thanks for the questions, by the way. So we have one question from Dr. Abadi. So, so the question is, how can we differentiate foreplay creeps hyperplasia due to chemical gastritis from foreplay creep hyperplasia in a juvenile polyp in an endoscopic biopsy? Forked creep hyperplasia Four, in a... Yeah, foreplay creep hyperplasia. Uh, that's what it meant. I'm afraid I have a very bad answer. I'm not sure. They can look absolutely identical. You're always stuck with context, background mucosa, and history. Okay, thank you. So there is another question from Mustak Hussein. The question is, how useful is chromogranin in checking for endocrine cell hyperplasia in autoimmune gastritis? The question, how useful is checking for endocrine cell hyperplasia in autoimmune gastritis? Yeah. How it's useful is chromogranin? It's fantastic. Chromogranin is great. Hopefully, if you have chromogranin, you can use it. And you know what? Even if you don't have gastrin, you can look at the pattern of labeling, and it will help you a great deal. So yes, go for it. Thank you. There is another question from Dr. Khalili. So the question is, it's long. On some occasions, the biopsies include severely atrophic body mucosa, and the endoscopies to describe a generalized appearance of an atrophic granular surface. ECL proliferation looks like multiple small microscopic nodules of islets and nests of endocrine cells. The question is, can we call it diffuse carcinoid? Can you call it diffuse carcinoid? Um, I guess that term has been used for extensive ECL cell hyperplasia. Um, however, I, it's a bit concerning because if you call it that, you might find yourself with a gastrectomy that might be overkill. So unfortunately, it will have to be on an individualized basis. In the past, patients used to get um, antrectomy to remove the excess gastrin. Uh, nowadays, they tend to do uh, uh, more conservative things. There was another question earlier that what are the clinical implications of autoimmune gastritis? But we, oh, no, we no, have we discussed it, right? We have and we haven't. So okay. the main clinical implications of autoimmune gastritis 
uh, are actually nothing to do with all these adorable polyps that we've just seen. The key thing is that the patients are at risk for both iron deficiency and pernicious anemia. And they will walk in the door presenting only with iron deficiency anemia, and it's a real fooler. That's because they have high gastric pH, so they don't absorb their iron properly. And then, of course, if they do come down with full-blown pernicious anemia, it's a neurodegenerative disorder. So the patient can, uh, well, have neurodegenerative disease. So you really want to do your patient a favor and diagnose it uh, so they can get their B vitamin B12. Yeah, there is another question from my attending at Mount Sinai, Dr. Levy. So he's asking, have you ever used lysozyme immunohistochemistry to identify pyloric genetoma? Have I used lysosome in, in immunohistochemistry? No, I'm way too stupid for that. I don't think we have it, plus I just do it on the HNE. <laughs> okay. I have a very simple question from my side that, uh, that you have been saying that to differentiate uh, gastric adenomas between intestinal type and gastric foveolar type, what is the like, I mean, clinical implication for that? So in a Western population, adenomas that show pure intestinal differentiation, thanks for bringing that up, uh, tend to be those that arise in the background of gastritis, can be multiple, and are far, far more likely to be associated with invasive carcinoma or dysplasia that's flat in the surrounding mucosa. The very rare gastric foveolar adenomas in a Western population uh, tend to be just minimally, uh, they're, they're just nuisances. They're, they're very benign polyps with absolutely no associated risk. This is a bit confusing because colleagues in Korea published a paper of, about gastric adenoma intestinal versus gastric type. It was a little bit different from our population. These patients all had gastritis with intestinal metaplasia and very damaged mucosa. And those whose adenomas showed only intestinal differentiation had a lower risk of progression than those whose adenomas showed both intestinal and gastric type differentiation. So we're kind of talking about issues in different populations. Thank you. There is another question about what's the role of P53 in the diagnosis of gastric dysplasia? What's the role of P53 in the diagnosis of gastric dysplasia? I don't have a lot of experience with it. And it can be quite disappointing. It's frequently uh, negative in pyloric gland adenomas, and it's certainly negative in what I've been calling out syntic gland adenomas. And it's variable in intestinal type adenomas or intestinal type dysplasia. So it's just like using P53 elsewhere. You have to use it in the context of what you have. And of course, you want to look for very strong nuclear labeling. These are the questions that we have. Is there anybody with any other questions? Okay, so thank you everyone for joining in and thanks for the online audience who have joined from all over the world. And thanks for your questions. And thank you, Dr. Mulgory, for such a nice uh, talk and the slide seminar. So over to Emilio. All right, thank you, Rafat. And thank you very much, Dr. Montgomery, for sharing all these uh, great gastric polyp cases and uh, beautifully explaining their pathobiology. This was uh, truly an excellent session. Um, so Dr. Montgomery is going to be having, uh, having a few more lectures coming up in the next couple of weeks. So please make sure to follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, Twitter for updates on some of the upcoming lectures. And as always, today's session and all previous sessions are archived here on Facebook and YouTube, as well as our iTunes podcast page. So thank you again all for joining us, and we hope you have a great day. And yeah, just to remind about the um, Spanish sessions also. So we will be having a few Spanish sessions very soon by Dr. Voltaggio and Dr. Montgomery. That's correct. So Dr. Voltaggio and Dr. Montgomery are going to also be Actually, this same session is going to be broadcast in Spanish, and we'll be posting uh, uh, updates about when those lectures are going to happen pretty soon. So just stay tuned and make sure to follow our Facebook and Twitter pages. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yay.